Number 1. Jose was last seen in Panama City, Florida on March 3, 2014. He was a mechanical engineering major at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and had traveled to Florida with 22 other students for a spring break trip. He and some friends rented a house on Front Beach Road. He disappeared at 7 p.m. on March 3, four days into the trip, and has never been heard from again. His friends reported his disappearance to the police at 11 o'clock the next morning, after they found some of his clothes at the beach. The clothes had not apparently been there when cleanup crews cleaned the beach at 6 a.m. that day. Authorities found some more of his clothing and his cellular phone in or near a trash bin behind the rental house. His wallet, laptop computer and suitcase were left inside his bedroom in the rental house. Investigators speculated Jose had drowned while swimming in the ocean under the influence of drugs. Jose's friends told them he had taken LSD and made strange remarks before his disappearance about wanting to hurt himself, but his family said he was looking forward to graduation and getting a job and wasn't suicidal. They also stated drug use was uncharacteristic of him. The water in the area was also still cold at that time of year and very few people were swimming. According to Jose's family, by the time they arrived in Florida on March 5, 16 of the students Jose went there with had already packed their things and returned home. Those 16 were never questioned by police. Of the six who remained, two of them refused to speak to the family and one of those even hired a lawyer. The other four provided different stories as to what had happened to him. Jose is a native of New York and graduated from Shaker High School there. He disappeared during his last semester at Rice University and would have graduated with a straight-A average. His case remains unsolved. Number 2 Kaiser was last seen walking away from her home at the Southern Palms Mobile Home Park in the 5200 block of 14th Street West in Manatee County, Florida on the morning of December 30, 1991. Her husband stated she packed her bags and left, saying she was going to meet a man named Kevin. Kevin has never been identified. Kaiser has never been heard from again. Her father reported her missing about a month after she disappearance. Kaiser's marriage was troubled. She had left her husband for brief periods at least 10 times in five years, and he'd been accused of battery against her three times. Two of the cases weren't prosecuted, Kaiser's husband didn't contest the third and was placed on probation for 18 months. Kaiser's husband said they had settled their differences prior to her disappearance and weren't fighting, but she told her father she was unhappy and wanted to leave her husband. She had always kept in touch with her father and other relatives in Mississippi during the times when she left her husband, but none of her family has heard from her since December 1991. She also left behind a $300 paycheck at her workplace, the Econo Lodge in Bradenton, Florida. Kaiser's father, who reported her missing, believes she is dead. Her husband divorced her after her disappearance. Her case remains unsolved. Number 3. Kenyon disappeared from the parking lot of Coral Gables High School, where she worked teaching special needs children, at 3 p.m. on March 5, 1984. She spoke to the security guard, then drove away in her car, a Chrysler convertible. When she didn't arrive home at her apartment on Ives Dairy Road, her roommate wasn't worried at first and assumed she had gone to visit her parents in Pompano Beach, Florida, 30 miles up the coast. Kenyon was carrying a duffel bag containing workout clothes and a curling iron when she vanished, she left behind her purse. A Shell gasoline station attendant in Coral Gables, Florida who often sold fuel to Kenyon, recalled seeing her on March 8. He said she had been driving her car but had been talking to a man who drove a Cadillac Eldorado. They seemed to be conversing about someone taking Kenyon's picture and Kenyon told the station attendant that she was going to the airport. The man with the Eldorado paid for her gasoline and they drove off together. Kenyon has never been heard from again. Kenyon was not reported missing until she failed to show up for work the next day. Her car was found abandoned at Miami International Airport on March 11, six days after her disappearance. She did not have plans to travel and had not packed to go anywhere, and her name was not listed on any recent flights going out of Miami. Her family says it is extremely uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning. Kenyon is a former fashion model who won the Orange Bowl Princess title in 1982 and was a finalist in a Miss Florida contest. Christopher Wilder almost immediately became a suspect in her disappearance. Photos of Wilder are posted with this case summary. The gas station attendant identified him from a photograph as the man last seen with Kenyon. 
Wilder, who is a native of Australia, has been linked to at least a dozen disappearances, rapes, murders and or attacks of women in the early to mid-1980s, including the disappearances of Mary Oppitz, Rosario Gonzalez and Tammy Leppert. Wilder sometimes attempted to lure young female victims by offering non-existent modeling sessions or other tactics, and he knew Kenyon. They had dated a few times and he had even proposed marriage to her, but she turned him down because she thought he was too old for her. Wilder was put on probation in 1980 after pleading guilty to attempted sexual battery towards a teenage girl. While on a visit home to Australia that same year, he was charged with kidnapping and sexually assaulting two teenage girls. His parents bailed him out of jail and he flew back to the United States, promising to return for his trial which was set for April 1984. Wilder, when initially questioned by police about Kenyon's disappearance, said he had not seen her in over a month. However, two gas station attendants claimed to have seen Wilder with Kenyon on the day of her disappearance. In addition, Wilder knew where Kenyon's car was before this information was released to the press. Wilder went on a killing spree later in 1984, where he traveled across the United States, abducting, raping, torturing, and killing women along the way. He was killed in a struggle with police officers in New Hampshire in the late spring of 1984 and died without ever divulging what he might have known about Kenyon's disappearance. Kenyon is a graduate of the University of Miami and was the coach of the cheerleading squad at Coral Gables High School. Her parents are now deceased. Her case remains unsolved and foul play is suspected due to the circumstances involved. Number 4 Linda was last seen at her residence in the 2100 block of Dolly Street in Orlando, Florida at 4 p.m. on February 18, 1976. She left home to visit her boyfriend, who lived on Aaron Court about three blocks away. She left her purse and shoes behind at home. She never arrived at her boyfriend's house. Ten days after Linda's disappearance, someone called Linda's father and said were holding her and would release her if he paid a $20,000 ransom. This turned out to be a hoax, and a local married couple was arrested and charged with extortion. A few months after she went missing, Linda was reportedly sighted dancing in a topless bar in Jacksonville, Florida, using the name Dawn. The bar was frequented by members of the Outlaws motorcycle gang, and police said there was evidence that Linda left willingly with the gang members. The witness who identified Linda also noticed a scar on her leg, but Linda's father doesn't believe she was really the young woman at the bar and stated she would have called home on her mother's birthday if she could have. In 1982, six years after Linda's disappearance, her sister-in-law, Carol Joyker, was shot and stabbed to death. Her body was found buried in a shallow grave in Osceola County, Florida. A year later, Keith Barton Kerr was arrested and charged in her death. He was Carol's brother-in-law, she was married to Linda and Keith's older brother. Authorities stated Keith had also committed telephone harassment against about 40 women, most whom were Walt Disney World employees like Carol was. The victims got threatening calls from a man graphically describing how he planned to murder them. The details the caller described were very similar to what happened in Carol's death. Photos of Keith are posted with this case summary. After his murder arrest, authorities began investigating the possibility that he was also involved in Linda's disappearance. They were unable to find any evidence to link him to his sister's case, however. In 1984, he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in Carol's death and was sentenced to life in prison. He remains incarcerated. Although it's possible Linda ran away from home, it's extremely unusual for a runaway to be gone for decades without any contact with her family. Foul play is possible in her case, which remains unsolved. Number 5 Kindred dropped his children off at daycare on the morning of October 1, 2001, and then continued on to a now-defunct auto parts store on State Route 60 east of Bartow, Florida. He was last seen talking to two men at the business. He was never heard from again after that. His white Ford F-150 pickup truck was later found abandoned at the Lakeland Speedway convenience store located at Comtree Road and AZ Parkway. Kindred had sole custody of his three young children in 2001 and is described as a devoted family man, and it's uncharacteristic of him to leave without warning or be out of touch with his loved ones. Robert Ernest Levesque was indicted for second-degree murder in Kindred's case in July 2003, but the charges were dropped in April 2005 before the case could go to trial. He was indicted again, this time for first-degree murder, in May of that year. A photo of him is posted with this case summary. Levesque, a career criminal with convictions dating back to 1969, 
was one of the men last seen with Kindred, and surveillance camera footage proved it was he who parked Kindred's vehicle, where it was later found abandoned. Levesque owned a chop shop that processed stolen vehicles, and Kindred had arranged to buy a chopped Ford pickup truck from him, but Levesque told him he wouldn't be able to sell him the truck. Kindred allegedly became angry and threatened to expose Levesque's criminal activities to the police. Authorities believe this was the motive for the murder. At one point in 2002, Levesque offered to lead authorities to Kindred's body, but the deal fell through, and he refused to cooperate any further. At his trial in late 2005, Levesque's attorney argued there was no hard evidence to connect him to Kindred's murder, and no proof Kindred was even dead. Levesque's girlfriend testified against him, stating he had borrowed a shotgun on the day Kindred disappeared, and when he returned it, there were signs that it had been fired. A cellmate of Levesque also testified, saying Levesque told him he killed Kindred to silence him. Levesque was convicted of second-degree murder in December 2005 and sentenced to life in prison. He maintains his innocence. Foul play is suspected in Kindred's disappearance due to the circumstances involved. Number 6. Klett was last seen in Hollywood, Florida during the early morning of October 31, 2004. She was accompanied by her boyfriend, Morgan Antonio Bolanis, at the time. Bolanis is the father of three of Klett's five children. A photo of him is posted with this case summary. Klett and Bolanis met in March 1998 and violence surfaced in the relationship within months. In September 1998, Bolanis was charged with attacking Klett while she was pregnant. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to probation. Their relationship remained volatile, and Bolanis was jealous and controlling. He kept track of the mileage on Klett's car and repeatedly accused her of infidelity. Her family had been trying to convince her to leave him. Bolanis had allegedly assaulted Klett in June 2004, and she was hospitalized for 10 days as a result. She later said he choked her until she blacked out, allowed her to regain consciousness, and then choked her again. He was charged with assaulting her and was supposed to be under house arrest while awaiting trial and was ordered not to contact her. However, Bolanis cut off his electronic monitoring bracelet and went to see Klett anyway. By then she had recanted her statements about him attacking her. Klett left her children with a relative and went out with Bolanis. She invited a friend along, telling her friend she didn't want to be alone with Bolanis. The three of them went to various bars until 2.30 a.m., then went back to her friend's apartment. Klett and Bolanis were arguing by this time. This is the last time anyone saw her. Bolanis disappeared on November 1, the day after Klett was last seen. Ten days later, he was arrested in Orlando, Florida. Klett was not with him, and he denied any knowledge of her whereabouts. He was jailed for violating his house arrest, but has not been charged in connection with Klett's disappearance. Foul play is strongly suspected in Klett's case and Bolanis is the prime suspect in her disappearance. She worked the night shift as a waitress in 2004. Her case remains unsolved. Number 7. Kividel McPike Niffin, 31, was last seen at a residence on McClutchen Drive, now called Blackmon Drive, in the small town of Jay, Florida, on September 14, 1985. At the time, she was a mother of two and coping with a rocky marriage to her husband, Malcolm Niffin. Kiva seemed to be the primary caregiver of her children, I have not been able to identify if Kiva also worked outside the home. The Doe Network page notes that her husband was a minister at the West J Church of Christ, a place which is no longer in existence and now houses a feed store. The Niffins had experienced some hardships over the years. Kiva had given birth to two biological children, Jory, in 1975, and Reuben, in 1976. Tragically, Jory died in 1981 at age 6, and Reuben died in 1983 at age 7. According to Kiva's mother's obituary, both children died of a brain disease, undoubtedly a heartbreaking period for the Niffins. Kiva and Malcolm eventually opened their hearts again and adopted two more children. Unfortunately the timeline is a bit cloudy. I have extracted what I can from online sources, including posts where Kiva's daughter and niece have further clarified the circumstances around her disappearance. I encourage you to find the Facebook page they host for Kiva to see images and clips that show what a vibrant person she was. Divorce proceedings were initiated in February 1985, but it appears they were never filed or were dismissed after filing. At some point close to the time of her disappearance, although unclear if this is before or after the divorce proceedings were filed, they planned a getaway to New York City. Kiva's mother, Phyllis, agreed to watch the children, but the trip never occurred. According to her niece, Kiva had a boyfriend after she and Malcolm separated. 
known as Wally he was supposedly questioned and cleared by police. Although there is little information about the nature of their relationship, the children knew Wally by name. Malcolm's story about her disappearance is that he claimed Kiva left with friends he didn't know. Notably, Malcolm was not the one who contacted police to report her as a missing person. The report was filed by her sister, who lived in Indiana at the time, after Kiva did not cash a check the sister had mailed for Kiva's birthday, which was September 9. After Kiva's disappearance, Malcolm and the children stayed in the area for a few weeks. Then, they cleared the area, and Malcolm sent the children to be raised by some of his family members in Port Arthur, Texas. Kiva's niece noted her sight of the family would have happily taken the children in. In 2013, at a Church of Christ in Moore, Oklahoma, Brother Malcolm Niffin gave a sermon about the no-exception divorce doctrine espoused by the Church of Christ and Malcolm himself. Essentially, under no circumstances should an individual get divorced. Another individual, George Batty, published a rebuttal in which he quotes Malcolm's words, uncovered by a poster on Websless, which gives some insight on the circumstances before Kiva's disappearance. I have the exception. My wife left me. She went down to the court I lived in Florida right north of Pensacola. She went to the Florida law, filed divorce on me, and in Florida when they do that you've got 30 days to leave the premises. So I left 29 days early. I packed my U-Haul and I left out. The day I left, her boyfriend moved in. I have the exception. But I have remained unmarried unto this day. There is no evidence supporting or disputing his account of their separation. Before evaluating Malcolm's apparent embrace and defense of the church's values, a sidebar. At the time of the speech he was living in Waco, Texas, and it appears that a Malcolm Niffin had a few run-ins with the law, including a charge related to prostitution. I cannot confirm this is the same person, but it seems likely but Malcolm's 2013 account leaves some questions. First, the divorce proceedings were dismissed when NY. Second, he said he moved out the day after the divorce was filed, which would have been February 1985. If that were the case, how would he have known that Kiva left with friends the day she went missing? Her location of disappearance is her residence. Although it's possible he could have been babysitting at their house, this seems unlikely if her boyfriend had moved in with her as Malcolm claimed. Currently, Malcolm lives in Lorena, Texas, and it appears he travels to various places, preaching, debating about divorce, and officiating funerals. Unless there is another Malcolm Niffin in operation, he has appeared at religious events in Oklahoma, Missouri, Virginia, and West Virginia in the past few years. Interestingly, Kiva's father's obituary in 2008 lists her as a survivor, it makes no mention of Malcolm, but does mention Kiva's children, his grandchildren. Her sister Teresa's obituary in 2013 states that Kiva preceded her in death. Kiva and Malcolm's two surviving children are now adults, although the nature of their relationship with their father is unclear. Regardless, several of Kiva's family members are still trying to find out what happened to Kiva McPike Niffin.